Heavenly Father, as we come here today to meet together around your table that you've prepared for us, we're just thankful that we are all able to be out. We're thankful for this day that we have set aside to honor our mothers. But Father, we're most thankful for what you have done for us through your son, through his sacrifice, and through your power over death. We just pray that you will be with us throughout the rest of the service. Be with Jeff as he brings our message this morning. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When you build your structure, it's important that you have a good foundation. It's important for the church. You know, that foundation is Jesus Christ. The church is one foundation. <laughs> fortunate to have the scriptures that we can look at and read every day and learn from those. So we take those words and use them in our lives each and every day. They become wonderful words of life. Christ did for us, as this hymn says, how marvelous, how wonderful, 
that he came here to earth and he died there on the cross for us. The things that we have because of that. Let's remember these things now as we come around the Lord's table. It's been almost 35 years since the Northwest Airlines Flight 255 crashed into the Detroit suburb of Romulus. The plane was just cleared to runway at 8.46 p.m. on August 16, 1987. When it tilted slightly, the left wing clipped the light pole and damaged the airliner, sheared the top off of a rental car building. At only four years old, Cecilia Crocker was the lone survivor that plane crash that killed 154 people aboard and two on the ground at Detroit Metropolitan Airport. The reason she lived was because as the plane was about to crash, her mother unbuckled herself and covered up her daughter with her own body and protected her as any parent would do for any of our own children. At an interview, Cecilia said, I think about the accident every day. It's kind of hard not to think about it when I look in the mirror. She said I have visual scars, my arms and my legs, and I have a scar on my forehead. She also said, I see it as so many scars were put on my body against my will. Now you're probably thinking, what's this have to do with anything? Well, think back nearly 2,000 years and remember the visual scars on Jesus' hands and feet from the nails that held him to that old rugged cross. And the scars on his forehead from the crown of thorns, so many scars were put on his body against his will. One thing is for sure, we have no capacity to appreciate the utterly horrific experience of having the sins of the world put upon the Lord Jesus as he hung in excruciating pain from that cross. The physical pain must have been immense. So just as that mother of four-year-old Cecilia covered up her 
to save her life that day in 1987. Nearly 2,000 years ago, Jesus also covered up our sins so that we may have everlasting life with him, as it says in 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sin, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. So to reflect on what Brad said last week about being in the right state of mind as we come around this table, we just can't eat the bread and drink the juice like a daily routine. There's a lot to think about when we come around the Lord's table. We must think about the things that happened that day on that cross when Jesus died for us. He washed away our sins. He brought in the new covenant, which we live under today, and he fulfilled the prophecy. So before we partake of these emblems here this morning, to remember Christ and all he done for us, let us see how the psalmist foreshadowed the Messiah in his suffering for us. As I read from Psalm 22, 14 through 18, I poured out like water, and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. The gang of evildoers have, has closed in on me. They pierce my hand and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothes. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, as we come around this table to partake of these emblems that represent the blood and the body of Christ, just let us remember the love that you showed us by giving up your one and only begotten Son. Let us forget about the things of this world for a minute and focus on you, Lord. For you are the reason we are here this morning. I pray that you continue to be with us in the congregation and in our daily lives. I just pray that we can, we can reflect Christ in all that we do. And as we journey out into the world this week, I pray that you forgive us of our sins and to help us to keep that on that straight and narrow path. As I pray all this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. from Mark 14, verses 42 through 72. Get up, let's go. See, my betrayer is near. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, suddenly arrived. With him was a mob, with swords and clubs, from the chief priests to the scribes and the elders. 
His betrayer had given them the signal. The one I kiss, he said, he's the one. Arrest him and take him away under guard. So when he came, he went right up to him and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. They took a hold of him and arrested him. And one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the high priest's slave and cut off his ear. But Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs as though I were a criminal to capture me? Every day I was among you, teaching in the temple complex, and you didn't arrest me, but the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then they all deserted him and ran away. Now a certain young man, having a linen cloth wrapped around his naked body, was following him. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth behind and ran away naked. They led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. <coughs> Peter followed him at a distance, right into the high priest's courtyard. He was sitting with the temple police, warming himself by the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for a testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they could find none. For many were giving false testimony against him, but the testimonies did not agree. Some stood up and were giving false testimonies against him, stating, We heard him say, I will demolish the sanctuary made by human hands, and in three days I will build another not made by hands. The other testimony did not agree even on this. When the high priest stood up for them all and questioned Jesus, Don't you have an answer to what these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer anything. Again the high priest questioned him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and all of you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his robes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. And some began to spit on him, blindfold him, and to beat him, saying, Prophecy. The temple police also took him and slapped him. While Peter was in the courtyard below, one of the high priest's servants came. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, You also were with the Nazarene Jesus. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you were talking about. And he went out to the entryway, and a rooster crowed. When the servant saw him again, she began to tell those standing nearby, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. After a little while, those standing there said to Peter again, You certainly are one of them, since you are also a galley. Then he started to curse, and to swear with an oath, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed, second time, and Peter remembered what Jesus had spoken before to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. When he thought about it, he began to weep. Children are dismissed for their time this morning. since we live in a farming community we continue to pray for favorable weather so that the crops can be planted and grown and harvested but Father we always ask these things according to your will Father we're mindful is a blessing that you provide for all of humanity. And Father, we're thankful that you have always taken care of your creation and that you will always take care of your creation no matter what the politicians <coughs> have to say. Father, it is your creation are Lord over and you rule sovereign over your creation. Nothing that humanity 
does can never change. So, Father, our prayer is, is that the people of our nation will be more concerned about the Creator than the creation. That, Father, we will be more concerned about serving you than serving your creation. And certainly, Father, that we would be more concerned about honoring you than being concerned about your creation that ultimately we have no control over. So, Father, forgive us when we fail to give you the honor and glory that is due you. Help us, Father, and forgive us of our sins, Lord, when we choose to worship the creation more than you. And Father, we understand what your word teaches about what happens when a nation chooses to worship creation rather than you. Father, we're thankful that we could be together here today in this facility that you have provided for us. We're thankful, Father, that we could come in out of the rain. Father, help us to appreciate your manifold blessings here at Pine. May we always realize and acknowledge that everything that we have comes from you gift. It's a blessing that you have provided. Father, we're so thankful for your church. Father, we know that your church is victorious and will always be victorious right up to the end. When Jesus hands the kingdom back to you, Father, we will spend all of eternity with you on that new earth that you're going to create just for your people. Father, we're thankful for your scripture. We're thankful, Father, that you love us enough to tell us about yourself so that we can get to know you better, so we can strengthen our fellowship with you. Father, as we approach your word this morning, we pray for understanding. We pray, Father, that you will help us as we seek to put discernment into practice. Father, as always, we ask that you forgive us of our sins. And we ask, Father, that you be faithful to your promises in the scripture and forgive us to the exact same extent in which we choose those who sin against us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, great right, today of scriptures this morning. To the law and testimony, then we are in Philippians chapter 2. Our text this morning will be Philippians chapter 2, verses 19 through 29. 19 through 29. Believe it. Or not. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2 will begin with verse number 19. Now I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I also may be encouraged when I hear news about you. For I have no one else like-minded who will genuinely care about your interests. All seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know his proven character because he has served with me in the gospel ministry like a son with a father. Therefore, 
I hope to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. I am convinced in the Lord that I myself will also come quickly. But I considered it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, as well as your messenger and minister to my need. Since he has been longing for all of you and was distressed because you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he nearly died. However, God had mercy on him and not only on him, but also on me. So that I would not have one grief on top of another. For this reason, I am very eager to send him so that you may rejoice when you see him again, and I may be less anxious. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with all joy, and behold men like him in honor. Well, let's include verse 30 in there. How about that? Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. So we'll, we'll put an extra verse in here this morning, if that's okay. One of the things that we have talked about is being an overcomer. We all understand how difficult it is to walk that narrow path that leads to eternal life. And this morning I want to remind us again about the importance of being an overcomer because you see it is the overcomer who receives the crown of life. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2 for just a moment. Revelation chapter 2. In Revelation chapters 2 and 3, we have messages that Jesus has sent to some congregations. Here, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, we see a message that Jesus has sent to the congregation at Smyrna. And listen to what he says here in Revelation 2.10. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. So obviously they're going to suffer, right? Look, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you, and you will have affliction for ten days which means it's going to be a temporary set of circumstances. But listen to what Jesus says here, because these are the words of Jesus. Be faithful until death. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. So according to Jesus himself, Jesus says that it's the overcomer who receives the crown of life. Not the one who begins the race and doesn't finish it. And let's go over to chapter 3. In chapter 3, verse 11, Jesus is speaking to the congregation at Philadelphia. And once again, he is talking about testing that's going to take place. In verse 11, he says, I am coming quickly. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. So Jesus tells the church to hold on. No matter what's going on in life, you and I need to hold on. This goes back to what we were talking about last week in reference to Paul's example for you and me. So, 
We want to be overcome, don't we? We want to finish the race. And fortunately, there are many things that God has given to us to help us finish the race. First and foremost, he's given us his scriptures. His scriptures help us to be overcomers. He has also given us his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us to help us be overcomers. And the third thing that God has given us to help us to be overcomers are good examples. Good examples. And that's what we've seen in Philippians chapter 2. Because the first overcomer that Paul talks about is Jesus himself. And then we look at Paul. Paul was an overcomer. And Paul has set an example for us to follow. And the example that Paul set for us to follow is to follow Jesus. And now we're going to see two other individuals morning that were also overcomers. And it is wise for you and me to examine the lives of those who have become overcomers and learn from their example. The Bible is full of examples of those who have overcome this world. The Bible is also full of examples of those who did not learn from both, but today we're going to focus on two good examples. Paul mentions Timothy. Timothy was a native of Lystra. He had a Jewish mother and grandmother, Eunice, Lois. So mothers, grandmother, you have an impact on your children and your grandchildren. And they taught him the Old Testament from an early age. Unfortunately, his father was a Greek pagan. So praise the Lord for all those mothers and grandmothers who have brought their children and grandchildren to church when dad and grandpa stayed home. Amen? Amen. We understand that it is the primary responsibility of every single father to teach their children the fear of the Lord. But praise the Lord for those mothers who when the father shirked his duty to his children was willing to fill the gap. Timothy was fortunate enough to have a godly mother and a godly grandmother in his life. Timothy became an authentic disciple of Christ when Paul and Barnabas visited the Lyconian towns of Lystra and Derby on their first missionary journey. And then when Paul returns later on, Paul then selects Timothy as a companion traveler and protege, listen carefully to this, after the congregations at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. So Timothy had made an impact in such a way that there were two local congregations who said to Paul, you need to take this young man into consideration. And based upon Timothy's own life and what he had done in the midst of those two congregations, those two congregations were able to say, he is trustworthy, you should consider him. Now, why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because Timothy was not called 
in the ministry. Timothy was not called into ministry. We talked about this in other settings, but I want to bring this out again today. There is not a single bit of evidence in the New Testament that says any man is called to fulfill the function of an evangelist. That is something that's been pulled out of denominational literature. And unfortunately, there's still too many men in the restoration movement today who want to talk about being called to the ministry. I challenge you to find a single example in the New Testament where an evangelist has been called by God to preach. Now what's the big deal? Well, first of all, the big deal is the scriptures do not talk about it, therefore we shouldn't suggest it, should we? Amen? And second of all, we in the restoration movement one of the claims that we make is that we want to restore New Testament Christianity and we don't want to add or subtract anything to, the, to what we see in the New Testament. And we want to call Bible things by Bible names. Well, how about we do this right here, right now as well? Because here's the danger in all of this. I want you to think long and hard about this. Every example in the scriptures where God did, in fact, call someone specifically to a particular ministry, that individual was given authority. That individual was given authority. So, if that individual was given authority, then what must the people of God do when that individual speaks? Listen and obey. That's the case. If every guy that stands up in the pulpit and says, I've been called by God to preach, then why in the world can't we all agree on what we're preaching? You ever thought about that? Ponder on that for a while. All right. I'll get off my stump on that one. So Timothy became an invaluable part of Paul's life and congregation he served we have a lot of information about what Timothy was doing and I've given you scripture reference there in your outline and Timothy fulfilled the function of an evangelist in the church and what are the three permanent functions within the church what are they evangelists elders and deacons very good. Those are the three permanent functions that Jesus established and gave for his church. And Timothy then is to be viewed as a good example of faithfulness. And then Paul here in Philippians chapter 2 mentions Epaphroditus. And Epaphroditus was a representative from the congregation at Philippi. Based on what we read about him, he was entrusted with the gift that was sent to Paul in prison by the congregation. And all that is known about Epaphroditus is found in the book of Philippians. And Epaphroditus, too, is to be viewed as a good example of faithfulness. So 
here's our spiritual life principle for today. Authentic disciples of Christ will learn from the example of overcomers and follow their example. So, can we learn anything from Timothy? Absolutely. Can we learn anything from Epaphroditus? Absolutely. Should we follow good example? Absolutely. Number one, your outline this morning, Timothy was an overcomer. He was an overcomer. Therefore, we can learn from his example. Now, what do we know about Timothy that makes him an overcomer that we need to follow his example? Well, first of all, letter A, he was like-minded with Paul. He was like-minded with Paul. Timothy had the good fortune of spending a lot of time with Paul, being educated by Paul. And because of that, he was like-minded with Paul. And we have talked about this whole concept of being like-minded earlier on in our discussion of Philippians. Timothy filled the function of the evangelist. So his primary responsibility to the local congregation was to teach and preach the scriptures. Now, before Paul turned Timothy loose on the congregation, Paul spent many, many, many years training Timothy to do the work that Timothy needed to do. Now, Joe's here this morning. Joe's a preacher. Joe and I went to Bible college and we went to seminary. But we needed a lot more than that, didn't we, Joe? We needed a lot more than that. We needed age to some didn't we? Yeah. Because with age comes what? Yeah, experience, hopefully wisdom, right? Yeah. And here's something we're going to have to take into consideration. As the number of our Bible colleges continue <coughs> And as those Bible colleges that continue to exist continue to run rampantly toward liberalism, what are we going to do? Where's the next generation of evangelists going to come from? Well, more than likely, we're going to have to get back to doing the way they used to do it in the beginning. And that's training young men within a local congregation to do the work of evangelism. Here's something that we need to start thinking about here at the Pines. What, what are we going to do to help in this process? What Paul did is Paul focused his time and attention on Timothy in order to prepare Timothy to do the work that he needed to do. And in essence, what Paul did is Paul reproduced himself in Timothy. And thus, Timothy was like-minded with Paul. But because Timothy was well-educated, was given experience under the tutelage of Paul that he was able to do the work that he was supposed to do and ultimately he becomes an overcomer. What else makes Timothy an overcomer? Let it be in your outline. He had a genuine concern for the spiritual well-being of his fellow spiritual slave. Remember once again we talked about this whole concept. What was the favorite self-designation of every Christian in the early church? 
I am a slave. I am a slave of God. I am a slave of Christ. That means they were owned. And once again, we see this term used again here in reference to Timothy and to those in the church. Timothy had a genuine concern for the spiritual well-being of all of his fellow slaves. And let her see, Timothy was an overcomer because he had he has proven his worth to the church. Worth is proven. It's not what we say, it's what we do that matters the most. Timothy had certainly proven his worth to the church and all. Number two. Epaphroditus was also an overcomer. Did you get that right, Keith? Did, did you copy off Brenda? Okay. <laughs> you ought to see these two some Sunday morning. It's kind of comical to watch them be in my preach. What's that? <laughs> Competitive indeed. So number two, Epaphroditus. Also, is an overcomer. Now, what made Epaphroditus an overcomer? Letter A, he was faithful through trials and suffering. What does Paul tell us about Epaphroditus? He almost died, right? He almost died. But through all of that sickness, all of those problems that he had, did he cease to want to continue to serve Christ and the church? So even in the difficult times in his life, he still had his priorities straight. Christ and the church came first no matter what was going on in his life. And there are times when you and I have those same decisions that we have to make. There are difficult times in our life. But it's in those moments that ultimately shape our character. Character is shaped in difficult times. And the choices that we make during those difficult times. Epaphroditus was faithful and thus became an overcomer. Let her be. He placed others ahead of himself. Once again, his concern was not so much for himself, but rather for the congregation there at Philippi. And then let her see his attitudes and actions made him worthy of honor. Worthy of all. Let's go back to verses 29 and 30. Therefore, welcome him in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in honor. Now, Paul is not talking about this nonsense that takes place in our society today where we have idol worship of people who do nothing more but play a game, sing a song, or make a picture. The fact that an individual dribble a basketball and shoot it in a hoop does not make him worthy of honor. In fact, Mr. James is a man of no honor whatsoever. He does not deserve
There are many, many more just like him. But our society loves to worship the successful as the world defines successful. Well, if Paul looked at our country today, most of these people that we hold esteem and want to honor, Paul would say, no. These men and women are not honorable men and women, regardless of what their professions are. Honor is for those who are obedient to God. And those individuals and those individuals Individuals alone are worthy of honor. This is what Paul is talking about here. We need to understand this. So it was his godly attitudes and actions that made him worthy of honor. And then Paul goes on to continue to explain this in verse 30. Because he came close to death for the work of Christ risking his life to make up what was lacking in your ministry to me. So what Epaphroditus chose to do, even in the midst of his trials, his suffering, his sickness, Epaphroditus was determined to make sure that Paul and the church had what was necessary more so than he had concern for his own life. I wonder what the church in the United States of America would look like today if the church was filled with people who thought that way. See, one of the things that needs to be restored in our nation is honor. We need honor. We need honorable fathers. We need honorable mothers. We need honorable citizens who are more concerned about honor than they are self interest. Amen? To all of you military people, say thank you. No, not Memorial Day, it's Mother's Day. So that makes it easy. To all of our military people, we, we say thank you. Because you folks understand what honor means. Are they still trying to instill that in the modern military? Jeffrey Collins like says, what do you make, Mr. Shinnefield? Are they still trying to instill honor in all of our troops? Mm -hmm. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. They tried to instill honor in you, John, when you was in Marine boot camp. Did you hear me, John? Did they try to instill honor in you in Marine boot camp? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And Jan slept me. What's that? Mama slept to me. Mama slept to me.
finish with this today if I can get through it. If I can't, please bear with me. Then we'll do our thing tomorrow. This is entitled Paid in Full. My little boy came into the kitchen this evening while I was fixing supper. And he handed me a piece of paper he'd been writing on. So after wiping my hands on my apron, and then he can still wear an apron, <laughs> I read it, and this is what it said. Now you really know how dated this is. For mowing the grass, $5. Getting one for 50 now. For making my own bed this week, one dollar. And I couldn't write that on my list because I never made my own bed. <laughs> for going to the store, 50 cents. For playing with baby brother while you went shopping, 25 cents. For taking out the trash, one dollar. For getting a good report card, five dollars. And for raking the yard, two dollars. Well, I looked at him standing there expectantly, and a thousand memories flashed through my mind. So I picked up the paper and turning it over, this is what I wrote. For nine months I carried you growing inside of me no charge. For the nights I sat up with you, doctored you, prayed for you, no charge. For the time and the tears and the cost through the years, no charge. For the nights filled with dread and the worries ahead, no charge. For advice and the knowledge and the cost of your college, no charge. For the toys, food, and clothes, and for wiping your nose, no charge. Son, when you add it all up, the full cost of my love is no charge. Well, when he finished reading, he had great big tears in his eyes. And he looked up at me and he said, Mom, I sure do love you. And he took the pen and in great big letters he wrote, Pay in full. Thank you, mothers. Thank you so much for who you are. First question I have for you this morning is, what can I learn from Timothy's example? The Bible has a lot to say about Timothy, Timothy's ministry. We can read it as a matter of life and ask ourselves as we sit in self-judgment, what can I learn from Timothy's example? And obviously the next question is, what can I learn from Epaphroditus? There are things that we can learn from his life. Wow. Have I proven my worth to the church? 
someday when our race is over, will somebody be able to say about you and me that we have proven our worth for the church? And then am I worthy of honor? Once again, when your life comes to an end, will they say that you and I are worthy of all? I stand to say, I have a meditation. There's a fountain free. There's a fountain free just for you and me. Jeff was supposed to be our speaker because of some family situations. He's not going to be able to do that now, but still encourage you to go over for that. Uh, we'll be taking an offering. Uh, be, hopefully, we plan to build a, a chapel there. But we also got news this week that we had an $8,000 repair job that we have to take care of. So, need the money to help get that building built over there. All right, over here is a sign up sheet for the CRAM. So, if you want to sponsor a child for that, and Betsy will be with the sign. Sign up sheet for a special music after church here. So if you're into special music, you can get you signed up for that. And also for camp, we need supply food for the camp. We're going to do what we did last year. I just ask you to donate money for that. We'll go off and buy everything at one time. So we're going to put a basket out. Or... Okay, so that's over there for that. Okay. Got a few announcements from buildings and grounds. First of all, we had our cleanup here about three weeks, four weeks ago. We had a few jobs that didn't get done. I'm going to announce those, and if you are able to do those, please come see me. Uh, we need to get the gutters cleaned out on all the buildings. Um, we also need to do some uh, power washing. So if you'd be able to do that, let me know. There, the air conditioning units out here to the outside just need to be kind of cleaned up and straightened around. And one of the inside jobs that did get done that day was to clean all the bugs out of the um, light fixtures. So if you're able to do one of those, please let me know. Another thing, uh, some of you may know that we have a, one of the rooms, the middle room out in the motel, we call that the maintenance room. Well, it's become the junk room, and it's become a receptacle for all kinds of different things. It needs to be cleaned out. We're going to... Uh, get rid of everything that's in there that doesn't need to stay, but there are some things in there that maybe you've put in there in the past that you would like to rescue, 
For example, a Pittsburgh Steeler um, cornhole board. <laughs> and your sentiments may lie differently than the preachers. <laughs> Uh, I believe I was also t told that there's a smoker out there that maybe was left after one of the campgrounds or campouts. Probably some other things that through the years have accumulated. You might want to check out there. I was going to go out there and open it up today, but uh, due to the weather, I'm not going to. But I will open it up. But have you set a date, Don? Yep. All right. So there'll be, I would say, within the next couple of weeks. We got a couple of men that have volunteered to take care of things out there, and they will. But if you think you might have something out there that needs safe, or if you think it's something that maybe you want to go out and say, well, yeah, we might be able to use that for something in the future, make sure we know about it. Then the last thing I have is there is going to be some changes made to the entrances to the parking lot this week. So if you come in next week from Williamsport and you try to turn into that first um, entrance, it's not going to be there anymore. We're going to cut down the size of the entrance. We're also going to close off that entrance closest to Williamsport to try to prevent some of the big trucks and stuff that utilize our parking lot from time to time. And for some other reasons, you're probably not going to be able to get onto uh, County Road 97 without going on 42 after what's going to be done this week. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up just for the morning. So, thank you. I've got a couple of things real quick. Uh, one of the elders came to me uh, a couple weeks ago, and we are starting up communion for shut-ins. So I am starting it today. Uh, I'm taking care of Margaret. Uh, if there's anybody else that goes to the shut in or sick, let the elders know so we can get them on the list. Uh, the eldership will be taken care of with the uh, deacons in there. So they help it out with the uh, communion for shut ins and sick. Um, the eldership's got some goodies for the ladies, for the mom. If you're able to come up, please come up here and can please come up, get on the ship, and we wanted to give you a, a treat for all the good things you guys have done for the Florida Club. So, if you would, come up, please. Come up, come up. come on up here and help pass it out, Casey. Still sitting around the uh, Please stand for our benediction. Let us pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today to say thank you for all the blessings that you give this church, this church family. Thank you so much for our mothers out there that have done great things. Dear God, just be with us today as we enjoy each other's company and our fellowship. Again, we just thank you, God, for this church and we get to know you more each day, each day and be here and enjoy each other's company. In your name, amen. amen. Yeah. 